do hope that everyone does have a, a nice Christmas weekend, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day. Hope that you're just ask you to always be mindful of the Savior. Just think of Him. And but I'm glad that Jesus came and died for us. And not just so I can go to heaven. When I got saved, the night I got saved, I was seven years old. And I can promise you my number one reason for getting saved is I did not want to go to hell. And if that's the only reason, if that's the only thing that were to prompt you or to, to I mean, anybody in their right mind, faced with the reality of, of hell, and hell is real. And you're, you realize that, and you, you hear the story of the gospel, that Jesus died, was buried, rose again. He died for our sins. And you might say, well, I'm not sure if I believe that or not. Well, okay, so there's a chance it's true. There's, only, there's, a, there's, a, there's a chance, 50%, let's say, there's a 50% chance that if you die, you'll spend eternity in a place called the lake of fire, which the Bible says is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And there's no, you say, but there's only a chance. Okay, let's say there's only a 20% chance. But what if, what if we look at the gospel on the other side and it's 100% certainty, no chance at all, that you don't have to even fret or consider the possibility of hell. You can be 100% certain of the fact that heaven is your home. You've escaped the torment of hell. It's certainty. I mean, why in the world would we want to take a chance on the possibility of eternity in hell? And I believe the Bible makes it very clear. I, I don't think it's a 20% chance it's real. I don't think it's a 50% chance it's real. I believe with 100% certainty, and I wish it weren't true, but I believe with 100% certainty that hell is a real place. And I know what the Bible says. And I know that Jesus came to this earth, was born, whether it was on Christmas Day or not, it doesn't matter. But I'm glad we have a day where we remember the fact that Jesus was born. Amen. I love the Christmas story. And I rejoice in the fact that he was born. And I think about that. And I want to read some verses tonight. Um, truly, Jesus came to this earth to be our Savior. But more than that, he's the hero of the story. As a matter of fact, every person here has a story. You know who the hero of every story is? Is Jesus. You say, well, what if I'm not saved? He's still the hero. Even if a person refuses his offer of salvation, doesn't stop him from being the hero. Some people get concerned with that. They think, well, Jesus couldn't have died for everybody because not everyone's going to get saved. Think about that logic for a minute. He said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's an offer that God made to us by way of his son, Jesus Christ. And, and, and uh, you say, but what if I don't accept it? Well, that's, that's your choice. That's, that, that was my choice. The night I got saved, I was re raised up in church and revivals and Matter of fact, we didn't even go that night to a church where I normally would be in. Uh, it was a, another church, and we were there. And that night, uh, I was sitting there in the service, and the reality of hell was came to me. And I didn't, I did not want to die and go to hell. I realized that according to the Bible, that's where I was heading. And so, I, I did what a lot of seven-year-olds do. I fell asleep. And I've been repaid that for many times, preaching. What's a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Amen. Hardly a service passes. And I don't watch someone. And that's okay. Uh, they say not to worry about the people that sleep while you preach. They do that because they trust you. It's the ones that stay awake waiting to hear what you're going to say that you have to worry about. 
But no, I, I fell asleep that night. I really did. But on the way home, my mom said the strangest thing. She said, Travis, if you keep falling asleep in church, you're never going to get saved. Now, she, she, didn't have, she had no idea that unless God told her to say that, she had no idea that the Lord was dealing with me so much. I don't mean a little. I mean the Lord was dealing with me greatly that night. But I fell asleep. And the moment she said that, it seemed like two worlds came into my mind. The, and, and the one, for some reason, seemed... It seemed, it seemed what all of a sudden would have been so easy because all my life all I'd ever heard about Jesus. And if you said, do you love Jesus? I would say, yes, I love Jesus. And that's all I'd ever known. But all of a sudden, there was this stark contrasting choice. And, and it seemed like it was difficult for me to say it. But somehow or another, I opened my mouth and said, I want to be saved. I want to get saved. You know, and uh, then the devil kind of put on her mind, well, just wait till Sunday. But you don't wait to get saved. Sometimes folks don't get saved because God visited them and dealt with them and showed them they needed a Savior. And they said, I'll do that someday. And there was Sunday. And then that, you know what? That Sunday, the longer it goes, the easier it gets to say no. Well, I'm so glad that night that I said yes and I met Jesus my savior but there's more than that and I, I didn't know how i was going to bring this message tonight i would i'd like to preach this to you i'd like to stomp rant you know and st foam at the mouth and because it's exciting but i'm not going to do that tonight i'm, I'm going to tell you something i'm going to show you some scripture but first of all jesus came to this earth was born in bethlehem's manger because he wanted to save you and he wanted to save me the let the bible says let the redeemed of the lord what? I, I couldn't hear you. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. say so. All right. That just means, hey, I'm one. I've been redeemed. We sing the song. I've been redeemed. What does it mean? It means that Jesus found me. He, he sought me. I didn't look for him. He found me and he made an offer to me. He said to me in my sin, he said, I, I have salvation. He said, I can save you. That's why I tell you that he's the hero of the story. He said, I can save you and I can give you a home in heaven. There's a lot more to it. I'm going to get there in just a minute. I'm just going to, first of all, I just want to get to this point right here. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. I was lost and I was, I was on my way to an eternity in a place called hell. I realized that that night. Along comes Jesus, or along comes the, the gospel, which is the good news of the, of, the, of the Savior born in Bethlehem's manger, and then lived a perfect, sinless life, but one day was sent, was, was condemned, was tried and condemned unjustly, and sentenced to die on a cross for my sin, and then he was buried, and then he rose again. And today he lives victoriously over death, hell, and the grave. And because he lives, guess what? I live also. Everybody here, I could ask you to raise your hand, but everybody here has buried a loved one. And you know what it means to bury someone and, and, and to, to know that person knew Jesus. You don't, you don't whether you're saved or not saved, when you, when you say goodbye to someone, and you know that that person had a testimony of faith and trust in Jesus. Yes, it's sad. But you know, but also every person here knows, sadly, you know the feeling. We all do. How many of you know, the, how many of you know or at least fear that someone you knew possibly died without Jesus? Any, anybody here know that? Isn't, isn't everybody here? You look around, that's one of the saddest feelings. I, I had a fellow that I prayed for for years. And as far as I know, he never got saved. His mind went away. And, but I remember one night driving, I was in Bible college, and I started thinking about my friend Jerry. Jerry was a truck driver. And I worked with him at the farm. First time I ever met him, I pulled up at the farm. I was 16 years old. We were there to bail hay. And uh, he drove the tractor, and I threw the hay. 
and uh, stocked it, and he unloaded, and I'd stock it in the barn. He met me, and he said, I'm an atheist. Ray asked me where I went to school, and I told him I went to a Christian school. He said, I'm an atheist. I said, no, you're not. He said, okay. And we, 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 became, we, became, we became close friends. We really did. And I, I tried to talk to him. Every preacher that I knew that ever went to his house never made it past his front steps. He told him, I don't want to hear that stuff. They would bring big-time preachers in, but for some reason, he listened to me. But he never got saved that I know of. Now, I can't even dwell on that. I can't even think on that. Because there's no getting out of hell. My mind can't ration that, can't reason that. Can I, can I tell you it's a sad... But if you know someone that had a, a testimony of faith and trust in Jesus, that's just a, that, that funeral is just a formality because you know, you know whether you're saved or not, you know that they're, they're with Jesus. And you, you know that in your mind. Whether you want to accept it or not, you know that. You know that they're okay. There's, there's just a very few people that don't believe anything. A lot of times people tell you they're atheists. They're really not. There's just a small percentage of people that have their minds so uh, messed, messed up that they don't believe. Amen? I want you to know, understand something, that Jesus is the Savior of the world. He's the Savior of mankind. Now, the Bible says this in, in Genesis chapter number 5. I just, we, we've been looking in Genesis, and, and I, I just want you to see something just for a minute. Genesis chapter 5 uh, a lot has already happened up until Genesis chapter 5. We already, we already have the story and the history of, of, of a man named Cain. Who was Cain? He was the first murderer. He murdered his own brother. He, but more than that, he did it because he was angry and bitter against God. He, Cain, his brother Abel, brought an offering, and the Lord received that offering. And Cain brought an offering, and the Lord said, that's not what I want. And Cain said, what do you mean that's not what you want? This is what, it's just what you get. You don't tell God this is what you get. You say, God, oh, I'm sorry. Let me do it right. And God actually tried to show Cain how to fix it. But Cain said, if you don't like the way I did it, then tough. His own brother, he killed him. His own brother. I don't know if his brother was trying to talk to him or persuade him or whatever, but he murdered his brother. Cain became a rebel against God. We, we looked at it in Genesis chapter 4. Every child, grandchild, great-grandchild, all the way down the line of Cain until finally they quit even thinking about God. All the way down, they named their children names in defiance to God. They begin to build cities. They begin to to uh, they begin uh, to to say, you know what? We're going to prove that we can make it without God. That's where modern day humanism come from. The idea of humanism. Oh, look at those old fogies. Look at them Bible thumpers. Yeah, but you, someone might say that, but deep down on the inside, they're wondering, is it real or not? And that's why those of us that are saved ought to keep rejoicing in the Lord and keep singing. And no matter what goes on, if, if folks aren't kind to us or they're not right, we ought to keep being friendly and we ought to keep loving them. Why? Because we have Jesus living inside of us. Amen? He lives in me and he lives in you. And you, don't, you know what else? Because he lives in us, we're going to live eternally. Man, and so it's no, it's no issue. We should have joy unspeakable and full of glory. Amen? No matter what the world throws at us, no matter what problems we face, we can rejoice in the fact that we belong to Jesus and he's, he's mine and I'm his. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Think about that. Amen. You, you, know, you ever think about someone that's died, that was saved, and they've entered into the presence of God? I mean, they've seen the face of Jesus. They've seen God in his glory. Someone that was saved. And, and I, I can think right now of preachers that I know and, and, uh, and uh, the 
I'm, I'm, thinking of, I'm thinking of Brother Mullins right, as I see you sitting there, and I'm thinking about him preaching and reading his Bible and, and, and singing and talking to the birds, which was one of my favorite stories, and, and uh, tweeting at the birds, and they'd talk back to him. And, and, uh, but uh, I, I think about that, and I think about, though, I think about Brother Mullins and seeing the Lord, yeah, the one he preached about. Think about that. All the people that we've known through the years that have read and studied and struggled through this life and dealt with the upheavals of life and, the, and, and, and dealt with those things, but yet they, they, they knew the Lord Jesus and they were trusting Him. And maybe we even sat by their bedside and watched them die and breathe their last breath. But to think about the fact that when they said goodbye to us down here, they immediately entered into the presence of Jesus. And they're there with Him forever and ever, and they're waiting for us to join them. Isn't that something? That's not, I'm, that's not a fairy tale. That's a hero story. Jesus is my hero. He's your hero. Amen? I mean, he's, he's the one. I, I, I'm going to, Lord willing, preach this uh, soon. But he actually is, the, is, the, is the, the hero in the red suit. I mean, I know you don't believe that, but he actually is. Amen? The Bible says so. And, and we'll, we'll look at the scripture that te teaches that. But he's the hero that brings the victory and, and, and defeats the enemy and gives us salvation. He's the hero of the story. Now, Genesis chapter 5 is like a breath of fresh air. If you can get through the first four chapters of Genesis, it's tough. I mean, if you really think about it. You think about Cain killing his brother and all that's going on. But then, in, but then at the very close of chapter number four, something wonderful happens. God, God does what God always does. God says, you know what? I'm going to give you another chance. Boy, it's bad. How many of you rejoice in the fact that God is a God of second chances? Amen? Hey, do you know what? He's a God of second and third chances. And listen, I'm not telling you to test him to see how patient he is, but God is very patient. He's very merciful, and I can testify to the fact, and I can't even begin to think how many times God has said, you know what? Let's do it again. Let's do it again. All right, let's do it again. And in my mind, I wonder why, but I'm telling you, God is a wonderful God. And so in Genesis chapter number four, at the very end, something wonderful happens. The Bible says, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth, for God said she, he said she, for God said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also, there was born a son. And he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Seth meant substitute. The word Enos meant man, dirt. insufficient now Cain named his children names that were like man you're somebody you can do it you can build a city in fact I'm going to name the city after you and you're going to show the world how powerful you are and along came Seth and he named his son dirt you know why because the most important and the first thing that man needs to know about himself, and by the way, it's good for us to not ever forget it, is that that's all we are. Without Jesus, that's all I am, is a lump of dirt. You say, but, but I'm intelligent. Well, who gave you that intelligence? You say, well, I have great skills, but who gave you those great skills? You say, well, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm this, or I have this talent, but God gave you that talent. God gave you that ability. And by the fact, without God, I wouldn't have been able to get out of bed this morning. I was reading a story recently about a young girl, a teenage girl, uh, who has a, a certain uh, uh, form of illness, a birth-born uh, illness. But uh, so the flu is life-threatening to her. And she had just been in the hospital for almost two and a half months because of the flu. She's been on a ventilator. And they were talking to her, and she said, I'm just so glad to be alive. I tell you, when you're that close to death, you'll learn what it means to be so glad to be alive. You know that every one of us are just one heartbeat from eternity. 
Just one, one step. I mean, listen, you know why I'm standing here? Because God gave me life today. And the reason you're here is because God gave you life today. And the reason if you're here tomorrow or if, you, if you're alive this Christmas or you see another Christmas. And the last couple of weeks, I've seen so many people die and heard about loved ones dying. And, and got a report today about a man in the hospital that may not make it. And I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of folks that won't be here this Christmas. But if you're here, it's because... God saw fit to keep you alive. Life is in the balance. Amen? I don't get to decide when I die. When God calls, I'll answer. But I do get to decide because of what Jesus did for me. I can't earn my salvation. I can't do it. But I do get to decide whether or not I trust the hero. Whether or not I let the hero of the story be my hero. Whether or not I let him say he's the hero of the story, whether I trust him or not. Me being a, me being a rockhead doesn't keep him from being the hero. I can say to him, no, Jesus, you can't save me. But why is it that, I mean, Superman gets the hero, gets to be the hero if everybody doesn't get one, one, want the hero, but he's still the hero. But we want to act like Jesus is not the hero if somebody uh, doesn't get saved. He's the hero whether you trust him or not. And he wants to save you. But I want you to understand something. The very word Savior, that's what he is. Now, God gives us second chances. Genesis chapter 5 says this. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them. And blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Now that's what I am. I'm created. I'm a created being and you are also. There was a time when you were not, but God's always been. But, not, but listen, not only did God create man, but God created man with great glory and great honor. We're the only creatures. And like, I mean, I know folks don't believe, but there's not... There, Listen, if you got a dog, your dog is not going to talk to you. How many of you have a dog that talks? Anybody? All right. How many of you have a cat? Now, your cat might communicate to you, but if, you sit, if you're sitting there one day and you're, and you're sitting there and your cat rubs against your leg and then jumps up and rub, rocks behind you and then says, beautiful morning, isn't it? You're not going to feel comfortable about that cat talking to you. You're gonna, and your dad's are not going to get on the phone and say, hey, guess what? Because everybody will think you've lost your mind. I mean, I'm just going to tell you, but God's given us the ability to communicate. I can look at you, can talk to me at your eyes, and we can communicate, and we can talk to one another. God has given us that ability. No other creature has that. God has ornately uh, given us the gift to, to communicate and to speak, and God's made us different than every other creature. Now I want you to take your Bible and real quick, turn to Hebrews chapter 2. If you have a Bible, I want you to see something. And then uh, we're, in just a minute, we're going to be on our way home. Hebrews chapter number 2. It says this, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, Lest at any time we should let them slip. Verse 2 says, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? That's the, that's the, that's the salvation of the hero. Amen? I, I grew up watching one of my favorite hero shows was Mighty Mouse. How do you remember Mighty Mouse? You remember Mighty Mouse? Man, I love that intro to Mighty Mouse. When he'd come in, and I played it for the kid. I looked it up on YouTube, and I played it for the kids here. You know, they, and we, uh, we were watching Mighty Mouse. And, man, he'd come in. It didn't, ma it didn't matter. The little mouse, it didn't matter how many wolves were trying to kill the sheep. It didn't matter what was going on. Mighty Mouse would fly in. Man, there's bad guys flying everywhere. He, and he always saved the day. I love Mighty Mouse. But he didn't come in until right at the point where it looked like all hope was lost. I mean, the wolf has the sheep and he's 
got him in the pot and it's about over for the sheep. I mean, it's just about over. And then the music. And then comes Mighty Mouse and saves the day. I mean, always right in the nick of time. Not like the cavalry that came in late. But always in the nick of time. I mean, Mighty Mouse would come swooping in. That's what the Bible says. So great salvation. You know what that means? It Listen, it means right when it seemed like, when it seemed like all hope was gone. The Bible says in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son into the world to save us. Amen. There were people in Israel that were looking for the Savior. They were looking for the hero. They had heard about him all throughout the Old Testament. Isaiah preached about him and Joseph, uh, uh, the, the prophets preached about him. And man, they were looking for him. They were excited about it. There was a man named Zechariah that was still alive and, and, there, and his wife. And, and there were some, uh, some other people. And man, they were thinking, when is he going to come? They were so tired of the enemy, the Roman Empire, and all different kinds of enemies just kept pushing them down. And they had a whole history of just seeming like defeat after defeat after defeat. And they were waiting for their hero. But they had no idea that he was coming to them as a little baby in a manger. But that's how he came. When all hope was lost, Jesus came to bring salvation. Now, look here in this story, what the Bible says. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? So Jesus preached about the gospel, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. Now look at verse number five. Very interesting. It says, for unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But one, this is talking about David. One in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Meaning that, why, God, why would you esteem man? God, why would you think so highly of us? By the way, can I tell you something? No one, no one that ever hears the gospel should ever have a self-esteem problem. If you'll just think about what the gospel is, the gospel is saying to you that God sent his son, God valued you so much that he would send his son to die on the cross for your sins. How can we ever think, well, I'm nothing. I tell you what, low self-esteem people that know the Bible sometimes irritate me. You shouldn't, now, you, you shouldn't do that. And you can ask my, my wife. Don't, you, you, I tell you, it's, it's a good thing. You need, to, you need to think and realize how valuable you are to God. By the way, it doesn't hurt us to help remind people of that. Amen? In, in our words, in our, that's what gratitude is. We ought, to, we ought to constantly be trying to encourage people you know, you, you, you run somebody down, you demean somebody, they're not going to be a very good employee. A good, a, good, a good employer wants to help build up his employees and cause them to think, you know what, you're valuable to this company. You, you, make, you make a difference. You're a help. You help. We need you here. We need you at your best. Man, you make a difference. You want to instill higher self-esteem. Now, you have to correct problems. I understand that. And God corrects problems. But I want you to think about this idea of esteem. God esteemed you and I worthy of his son going to the cross to save us. But that ought to help. Amen. I mean, that ought to give you a little bounce when you think about it. I'm not talking about pride. We ought to be humble. But the fact of the matter is we ought to think about the great gift or the great expense that heaven spent on us. It's Christmas time, right? And everybody, you know, gift giving. And you and you want to you want to give people a nice gift, but you don't want to be broke, right? Anybody like that? <laughs> I mean, you know, and you at Christmas time, you'd like to live in a world if you'd like to live in a world where you just had endless money and then you could just 
It'd be a wonderful life, you know. But that's not the real world, right? So you have to try to make ends meet. You have to, you, you have to balance the equation. You, you know, you, you, you don't want to go to Kroger and put a quarter in the machine on the way out. And, of course, my, my girls like that. That's what I love about babies. They love that kind of stuff. Amen. You know, I got Beanie a little 50-cent cat, and I was her hero, you know. <laughs> Well, that changes as you get older, right? I mean, it takes a little bit more as they get older. But understand, though, you want to balance. You 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 want to you want to say to that person, you mean something. God said, "For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life." God wanted once and for all to say to you and I, to mankind, I want you to know how much I value you. I'm going to give my only begotten Son so that you can be mine. Now, don't ask me to explain that, but that's how much God values you. And I was thinking, I, th I think sometimes, Sister Connie, about your, your family and that missionaries there going, those people going to visit your mom, right? Yeah. How many years? Just almost two years. Two years, and what, almost every Saturday? Every Saturday. You, you, know, you know what the... You say, well, isn't that nice of those ladies? Yes, or those missionaries. But it wasn't them. It wasn't them that arranged that meeting. It was God. It was God that moved in their heart to go to Sister Connie's family and say to them, here's the gospel. It was, it was God that sent someone to you. I think about... Brother Steve driving in the, in the car, right? Just driving. I mean, and, and God knows how to get your attention. And God used a radio, right? A radio preacher to get his attention. And he, he told Charlie, he said, we're going to go to church. He said, now you'll need to get your life straightened up. Because they'll, no, just see. Uh, he, it was a little thing. He, he, he was worried about appearance, at, right? At the Baptist church or something. It's just a funny part of the story. But, but you know, Everybody, everybody do they think, well, what do I do? Well, just the best way to come to church is just come to church. Amen. Just be there. I mean, the devil tries hard to keep people from coming. We had a lady years ago, Miss, Miss uh, Raymond, Raymond and Lois, and visited them, visited them, visited them, visited them. And uh, Raymond's brother was dying in the hospital. I did the funeral, and um, they, they gave me something for doing the funeral, and I'd always been taught that if someone gives you something, you're not supposed to reject it, but that doesn't mean you can't give them something. So I went and got a $100 gift card and went back, and I, I don't do this all the time, it's just on this occasion. I went back and I said to them, I said, look, I said, don't, don't think me unkind or rude. I said, but I want one thing from you people. So I want you to come to church. That's all, I want you to come to church. And she said, I don't have any dresses. I said, I didn't come to check your wardrobe out. I said, I come to, I tell you, I want you to come to church. And both of them started coming to church. Lois thought she was saved. She's going to a Methodist church. We were praying for Raymond to get saved. And man, I was making up stuff. I was preaching stuff, you know what I mean, that God never even heard of. I wanted to get Raymond to get saved, you know, and praying for him and praying for him and finest man in the world. I mean, fine worker, do anything, wouldn't he? I mean, you all knew, but he wasn't saved. One, one day, Lois called me, and she was stamping church tracks. And she said, you know what? She said, I am not saved. She said, can you come talk to me? I said, I don't have to. I said, I'm not the one that saves you. I said, Jesus will save you. I said, you know what you need to do. You know the gospel. You know the, and I went through the gospel with her and talked to her on the phone, walking through the Canal City Kmart. They lived right close by, but I wasn't going to wait. I said, let's get, I said, you get saved. You ready to get saved? She said, I am. She got down on her knees beside her desk with church tracks in front of her and prayed and asked the Lord to save her. And a little while later, Raymond got saved. You know, he got saved on a Tuesday night at a, at a, at a revival meeting out in the middle of the country. Thursday, they didn't come to church. They always come to church. I thought, well, that's good. He gets saved and quits coming to church. That's a typical Christian. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, and I thought, well, where are they? Because they're always there. And that night, that getting ready for church, he bent down to tie his shoes and he couldn't speak right. He couldn't say his name. Took him to, down to the emergency room. They gave him blood thinner treatment for a stroke. But the problem is he had an aneurysm in his brain. 
and this treatment for the stroke caused the aneurysm to bleed more, caused a mass swelling in his brain. Now, he lived after that, but that was two days after he got saved, and he hardly ever knew who he was again from that day forward. I'll tell you something, I'm glad. You know what he said when he got saved that night? Raymond was a man. He was a man. Didn't say much. He shook my hand, tears running down his eyes. He said, now I'll get to see mom and dad again. You know who the hero of that story is? Jesus. So great. You know who the hero of your story is? Jesus. Amen. He didn't come with a cape on. He came as a babe in a manger. Amen. Now listen. The Bible says, but... What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? What, God, why would you visit us? Can you imagine if, you, if tomorrow, and it's, it's rough having the current president when I say this, um, but can you imagine if a legitimate president <laughs> called up and said, I'm, I'm coming by your house uh, tomorrow afternoon. Would that be Okay. President, pre, who? President, who? President of the United States. Mr. Sel, I, I'm, can I tell you a story? When Mr. Selby was here one day, uh, the Shelley Moore Capito campaign called him and asked him to come to an event that was being held at the Civic Center. And it was on a Thursday night. And he said, I'm sorry, I, I can't come. That's my church night. And he told me about it. So <laughs> I told Jess, I said, Jess, call him up like a day later. I said, and tell them you're with the Shelley Moore Capito campaign and that you'd like, they'd like to have him set up on the platform and be a special honored guest at the, at the thing. And she did it. he said, no, he said, I can't come. He said, that's my church night. <laughs> and, uh, but, but listen, if, if, if someone comes to visit an honored guest, but what is, you know, Jesus came to this earth as a baby in a manger, but more than that, he came to you, and he asked you to receive him into your life so that he could save you. Isn't that what? Why? What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Now listen, the Bible says this. But one, uh, it says, Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and did set him over the works of thy Hands. You remember Adam? To have dominion over the earth? God said, I'll set him over the work of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. You see what he's saying? He's saying, God, he said, I, get, I set man a little lower than the angels and I put him over all the earth and I put everything on the earth under him and in subjection to him. But that ain't the way it is. Because man can't even control himself, much less the world. He can't, he can't even take care of his own affairs. He, he can't save himself. So the Bible then goes on in Hebrews, and it says that, uh, verse number 8, uh, but now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see, verse number 9, who? Jesus. But we see Jesus. He's saying, I made man, and I, and I put him over the, the earth, but he's not ruling like he's supposed to. He's not reigning like he's supposed to. He's failing. He's fallen. But we see Jesus. Who is Jesus? He's the one that's going to make it right. Who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. The hero. He suffered my death for me. He tasted death for me. He took my punishment for me. The Bible says, For both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. That's what he calls me and you, brethren. 
and saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Now listen, this story goes on and it tells us about Jesus, the Savior of mankind. Now we know that, but then in the, in the last part of that chapter, it says, it uses the word to succor. If you look at it just for a minute, I'll show it to you. In, in Hebrews, uh, you're, you're in that same spot. Just keep your Bible open right there, and I'm just going to find it right here. Look, uh, look down at the end of the chapter at what it says, verse number 18. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. That word, that word means to come to the aid of, to come to the assistance of. Now, all that to, to say this, Jesus is, first of all, the Savior of mankind. We know that. The Bible tells us that. Second of all, because he's the Savior, he wants those of us who are saved to know where we stand with him. He wants us to know him. Listen, the Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 18, uh, it says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Grow in grace and in knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How many of you could say tonight, you know what? Honestly, the truth of the matter is, I do know Jesus better now than I did when I first heard about him and got saved. Isn't that good? That's the plan of God. First of all, God wants to save you. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God looks at I want you to die and go to hell. But after you get saved, God says, guess what? I want you to know me. I want you to get to know me. I want you to learn about me. And listen, I want you to learn the details and, 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 and intricacies of how I think and, and how I operate. I want you to, to know me. That's a pretty big deal. You ever... You ever you ever be, get around someone and you think, well, I'd like to get to know that person better? And I'll tell you something. The reason God saved us is because he didn't want us to die and go to hell. But second of all, God wanted me to get to know him. And this don't even make any sense at all, but I reckon he wanted to get to know me too. Because later on in the story of Genesis, there's a man named Enoch. And Enoch figured this thing out. And the Bible says Enoch walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. You say, what does that mean? You can say whatever it means. I, I get to say what I think it means. God just looked at Enoch one day and said, Enoch, you really don't fit in down there, do you? And Enoch said, not really, God. I like being with you. And God said, well, you love your family. He said, I do love my family. He said, but... God, I really like being with you. I like talking with you. and I like getting to know you. And I like walking with you. And he just walked with God. What does that mean to walk with God? We want to make it. He just spent time with God. That's what it means. That's how you get to know people, by the way. You don't get to know people by sitting here on the phone, you know. You get to know people by talking to them. And if you're ever around me, I'm going to ask you questions. See, that irritates me. Well, good, I'll irritate you because I... I want to know what you're thinking. I mean, I tell some of my kids, I said, you know the reason you don't get any Christmas presents because I don't know anything about you. I mean, I, don't write me a list, you know, on the last day of Christmas. I mean, I want to know stuff. I got to know something about you. You know what I mean? The way to get the good presents is to let people know what's, you know, what's on your mind. I mean, you got to, you know, give a little hint every once in a while. That means, uh, all I'm saying is you talk to people, they get to know you. They know what, you're, what you like. They know your favorite color. They know your favorite food. They know certain things about you. You become acquainted with them. You say, well, God already knows all that. Yeah, I know it. But for some reason, he wants to spend time with me and get to know me and talk to me. Now, I'm a clown, I know. And, uh, and uh, I, I got to start watching him more often. And, uh, but I want you to know something. God says, I want to know you. And Enoch one day... God said to Enoch, he said, I'll just forget about you all and talk to the baby here. And uh, I got your name for the drawing, but don't tell anybody. You're gonna, you're, he heard me say that, so that's why he started that. 
Listen, um, God said to Enoch, he said, you know, he said, you spend more time with me than you do anybody. He said, why don't you just come on to my house? I'd, I'd like to have you here with me. And Enoch might have said, well, God, you reckon I should go back and tell him? Nah, he wouldn't understand. They'll be up there someday, then they'll understand. Enoch got to know God so much that God just said, you know, Enoch, you fit in more with me than you do down here. Wouldn't it be something? He said, oh, not me. I want to stay down here. Wouldn't it be something if God just looked at you one day and, and said, you know what? You just, you belong with me. I think, you'd, I think you would fit in better up here than you do down there. You ever wonder sometimes why someone dies suddenly and you think, well, why, why did that happen? I think God just looks down every once in a while and says, see someone and says down here on this earth and said, yeah, I blessed them with your presence for a little while. You were down there, but you know what? I think it's time for you to come up here. You fit in better with me than you do down there. Can I tell you something tonight? Jesus, the hero of the story, he died on the cross to save you. He came to where you were and he found you and he saved you in the nick of time. And you say, well, I don't know. My story wasn't like Raymond's. Well, you don't know. You don't know what would have happened if you hadn't got saved when you did. But God saved you. And now that he saved you, guess what? He wants to know you. He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own for the joy we share as we tarry there. That's what marriage is. It's two people that decide, you know what? I want to spend the rest of my life getting more acquainted with you. I've decided that you're the, I, I want to know more about you. You don't know everything there is to know about a person when you get married, but you hope to spend the rest of your life learning about that person and growing in love with them. And that's what salvation is like. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all you do for us. Thank you, God, for loving us and dying for us on the cross. Thank you for so great a gift. As we